Darren, we haven't finished yet. Okay. <laughs> Was it the preaching? Was it something I said, brother? All right. If you'll reach into your uh, bulletin, you'll see this evening, or now we're afternoon, lesson is going to be on silence. The sound of silence. Um, we say a lot. We say a lot of words. In any given day, we talk, we talk, we talk. There's a lot of things. A study by the name of, a man did a study, Dr. Mathis Mel, and he did a study on how much women and men talk. So he had a group of 396 people, 210 were women, 186 were men, and he had a little um, voice-activated recorder that would go off when their vocal cords were vibrating. And so he was able to calculate how many words they were saying. And his research came up with this. His findings were that women speak on average 16,250 words a day. Men speak on average 13,000 words a day. Men, they just won't stop doing this. Talk, 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 talk. That's all they do. So women, while they talk more um, and men talk less, well, really, if you think about it, 16 to 13 is really pretty much in the same ballpark. So we really speak about the same amount of words uh, every day, whether you're male or female. But it's, a, it's an issue of what are those words? What is it that we are saying? Are we saying things that are going to be beneficial? Are we saying things that are good and godly? Are we saying things that are going to be an encouragement to others? Or are we using those words, whether it's a guy with 13 or a woman with 16, are we using those words to harm people, to tear people down, to say things that are not to an individual's benefit, but to their harm? It really doesn't matter how many words we say a day. It matters what the quality of the words are that we say every day. Well, pardon the pun, but the Bible says an awful lot about silence. Um, all throughout the scriptures, silence is found. It's found for many different reasons. It's found in many different situations, but silence is all throughout the scriptures. What I want us to do this afternoon is we'll look at different types of silence, and we'll see how those, sil those silences compare to what the Word of God says. So we'll work our way through four of them uh, tonight. Here's the first one. There is in scripture silence that is suitable, silence that is good. If you go over to Job chapter 2, Job chapter 2, and if you go down to verse 13, there are those times when we don't need to say anything, when silence is okay. And Job, in dealing with all of his adversity, losing his family, losing his livestock, his friends sit down with him and say they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. It was suitable. It was a time when he was going through these moments in his life where they said, you know what? We don't need to say anything. Nothing at all. I have a lot of people ask me um, when some, they have a friend that's going through a, a bad situation or they have a friend that's lost a loved one and they always feel awkward not saying something. And I always remind them, sometimes silence says a lot. Just to be there with an individual. Just to have your encouragement uh, for that individual. Sometimes those things come across without saying a word. And people appreciate it. So there's silence that is suitable. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2. You're in Job. You're in Job. Just keep turning. And you'll run into Habakkuk chapter 2. And verse uh, 20. 2 and verse 20. Keep turning forward in, in, your, in your Old Testament. There's times when we should say nothing. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before. That's a silence of reverence. That's a silence of coming before the throne of God knowing that nothing is, is suitable for me to say. There's nothing that needs to be said. I'm just in the presence of God and nothing is said. The Lord is in His holy temple. Keep silence before Him. And then there's one more silence that is suitable. If you go over to Revelation chapter 8, and I think this one might surprise you. Revelation 8 and verse 1 there was a time when there was silence in heaven. Now remember John's mandate. You need to write what you see and what you hear. 
So John is, uh, is, is on the offensive. John is looking for everything that he sees and hears. And John is watching these, these, th- this revelation as it unfolds before him. And one of the, he records lots of great things, wonderful things. But one of the things that might seem odd that he records is silence. I mean, we always think about the people before the throne of God, the creatures worshiping him, bowing down before him, which they do. We hear the singing that they do before the throne of God. And I don't think it's our first impression to say, you know, it's the silence in heaven that also matters. We don't think in those terms, but it happens. It says this, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That silence was suitable. God had ordained in that moment when that seal was opened that nothing needed to be said. I'll make this suggestion to you, brethren, that that silence was there for about half an hour because nothing needed to be said. And so silence is what was asked of all of those who are in heaven. So there's times when it's okay for us not to say something, just to sit quietly or to encourage another person quietly. And it's suitable. Well, here's a second type of silence. There is silence that is selfish. It's silence based on what I want, silence based on what I think is best, Uh, silence based on, well, you know, whether or not I want to really get involved or do anything or say anything. And this is not a good type of silence. This is a silence that not only does it weigh on us, but it weighs on those around us because it's selfish. Uh, Go over, you got to turn back to the Gospel of Luke, you're in Revelation. Turn back to Luke chapter 17. And beginning there in verse 17. <clears throat> These are the story of the nine lepers. And you remember, uh, ten lepers, uh, they came uh, to Jesus. They asked to be healed, and Jesus heals them. And then they go on their way, and it says this. So Jesus, we're cutting into the very end of the, the story. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten clean, cleansed, but where are the nine? Were they not were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. One person out of ten returned. One returned and thanked the Lord for what he did. The others, silent. Didn't say a thing. There was no, you've changed our life. Now we can be back in the community. No, thank you for this wonderful thing that you've done for us. Nobody came back and said, you surely are a man from God. You have these abilities. You can work these miracles. We want to hear more. We want to learn more. We want to grow more in our knowledge of what you want for us to do. There are so many things that they could have come back to say, the easiest being a simple thank you. You've changed our destiny. But nine of them decide not to say something. Now, brethren, that's selfish. That's selfish. There was so much that needed to be said by these men, but they didn't. We're thankful for the one that returned who understood that being silent would be selfish. Here's another example. Go over to Ephesians. Turn forward in your Bible. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll look at verse 13. And this is times when a thank you is not offered. A time when we fail to offer a thank you. It says this, Jesus said, In in him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. How can we not say thank you for the wonderful things that God has done for us? How can we not be thankful for, as it says here, that gospel of your salvation? Knowing that we've been taken from sin to salvation. Knowing that it was Christ who paid that penalty for us. The penalty of death for us so that we could have unity with God. But not to even say a thank you. Not to even recognize the wonderful blessing that has been done for us. But to remain silent. I don't know how it's possible, brethren. And I'll give you my perspective. I don't know how it it could be possible for us as a people of prayer, and we are. I don't know how it's possible for a people of prayer, when they do pray, not to have the subject of thankfulness come up. 
I mean, it's got to be there in our daily prayer life. It has to be there when we understand not just that we have a relationship with God, but what that relationship means. How that relationship changes us, how it changes our relationship with those around us, how it changes our relationship with those in the church, our place in the church, our work in the church. I mean, there are those times when we have to understand that a lot needs to be said. And one of those things that is important is for us to be a people who simply say, thank you. We don't want to be selfish for what we've been blessed with. We don't want to be a people who pass over it. We want to be a people in humility say, well, we thank you. We thank you for whatever it may have been. Thank you for the overall scheme. And here it's talking about salvation. I thank you for all of that. It's important. And when we don't do that, it's selfish. Okay. Here's a third type. There's silence that is sinful. And I want just I'll, before you come to any conclusion, just hear me out on this. There's silence that is sinful. Go over to Acts chapter 4. You have to turn backward in your Bible. Acts chapter 4, and go down to verse 18. So Here's examples, I'll I'll give you three. Here are examples when silence is not acceptable. Um, This is times when something has to be said. And because something isn't said, it can be sinful. And here you have the apostles, and it said this. So I'm cutting in verse 18, I'm cutting to the story. Um, Go back to verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against him, but when they had commanded them to go aside... Out of the council they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. What are we going to do about this miracle that everybody has seen? We can't say it didn't happen. We can't say it wasn't true. Everybody's seen it. So they say this, But so that it spreads no further among the people, Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So here's their plan. We can't stop the fact that a miracle is done, but here's what we will do. We'll stop them about talking about it. We'll tell them that they can't say anything more about this situation, and we certainly don't want them saying anything more about who Jesus is. We'll just stop them. Well, they have to make a decision. They've got to decide what they're going to do. So, if you notice in verse 19, it says this, But Peter and John answered and said to them, or excuse me, verse 18, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now, it doesn't end there. They get further threatened in verse 21, but it's not going to deter them. They're going to preach. I think of the same thing when I think of the persecution that started in Jerusalem and in Acts chapter 8, uh, 1 through 4, where they're scattered because of the persecution. They're scattered out of Jerusalem, and and it says they went everywhere preaching the word of God. They, They could not remain silent. Persecution just got them kicked out of Jerusalem, but they determined in their heart We can't be silent. We've got to go and tell people about Jesus. And so this is the decision that rests upon all of us. It's not just a decision that took place 2,000 years ago in in the first century. It's a situation that is very much in play today. We can't remain silent as members of the Lord's church. It is the church of Christ that's been given the responsibility to take the gospel to the world. There are great other institutions out there. They're wonderful. They do great things. But it's the church of Christ that's been given the mandate to preach the gospel to all the world. Now, if the church is silent on the preaching of the gospel, who's going to do it? Nobody else is going to come along and say to us, well, you know, you guys just focus on that worship thing and we'll do all the proclamation. It doesn't work that way. If the church is silent, it's sinful. If the church doesn't go out, regardless of what the consequences may be, and not preach the word of God, It's sinful. And not preach who Jesus Christ is. It's sinful. And not preach that there's a judgment that's coming. It's sinful. Or to not preach John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
to not preach those things, it would be sinful on our part. And this is what the apostles are saying. Well, you judge for yourselves what you're going to do. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to preach. We're going to do those things. And so we, we, can, we can relate to that because we understand that we're called to be a people, as Peter said, who are always ready to give an answer for the faith that is in us. When somebody asks, we can't be silent. If that question comes, we can't say, well, you know, I really don't want to don't want to say anything about it. You know, We have to be people who are heralds of the gospel and we speak. Again, if the church of Christ doesn't do it, who's going to do it? Nobody. If we here don't take the message to Blue Springs, who's going to take the message to Blue Springs? Nobody. It's our responsibility and we can't be silent. Well, here's another one. Go over to Luke. You're in Acts. Turn backward. Go over to Luke chapter 24. And go down to verse 47. Here again we see our call to be a people that speak. Uh, it says that, And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. The gospel has to be preached. It has to start. That day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, when the church comes with power, that's the kingdom. When the church is there, that's the, that's the kingdom as well. Church and kingdom are interchangeable. They're the same thing. The saved are out of the church. The saved are in the kingdom, right? The saved comprise the body of Christ. The saved comprise the, the body of the kingdom. So when that time came, they needed to be a people who spoke, who preached in the name of Jesus to all nations. The first place it started, Jerusalem. Where is it at now? It's all around the world, brother. People are preaching the gospel. Members of the Lord's church are preaching the gospel all around the world. And it's a big task. There's three to four million members in the Lord's church. That's it. There's eight billion people in the world today. That's a lot of people to evangelize for a small group of individuals. But the Bible tells us to go and preach the word so we can do it. So we know that it's powerful. So that we know the word of the, word of the Lord will go to all the corners of the earth. We understand that. We just have to be consistent. We have to be faithful. And we have to understand that if we say nothing, nothing at all, then that's sinful. Let me give you another example. Go over to Romans. You're in Luke. Got to turn forward. Go to Romans chapter 10. And I'll give you verse 4, beginning in verse 4. Here you see, again, that we're to speak. That, procl that proclamation is necessary. Uh, we'll begin in verse 4, and we'll, we'll work our way down to verse 8. It, <clears throat> where am I at? Romans 10, 4 to 15. There we go. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is in the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put ashamed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're not afraid of this passage, by the way. There are a lot of people in the denominations who say, this passage scares the church of Christ just scares them silly. That's not true. This is our passage. This passage belongs to us. This is the gospel. It belongs to us, right? This is ours. We understand what's taking place in this. We understand the thing in the context here isn't you're saved by faith alone. The understanding is a proclamation of that faith. Understanding that that faith is changes us and it makes us who we are as Christians, or who we identify with. So the whole entire passage is dealing with the understanding that it would be selfish for us as a people of faith not to get the word out there, not to talk about it, right? 
And what do we do as a people of faith? We want to build faith in others. Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes from hearing. What? Hearing the word of God. So it's no surprise to us that we confess Christ, the very thing he's talking about, that we believe in Christ, that we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. We've got no problem with that. That you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We've got no problem with that, right? Because we understand the overall context of what's being spoken here. This isn't the entirety of the gospel plan of salvation. We've got no problem saying that, yes, we need to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if you confess in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be safe. Absolutely, 100%, I agree. But in the overall understanding of what salvation is, there's more to be said. There's more that we need to confess. There's more that we need to obey. It gets us started. We agree with what it says. But we also understand if we stop here, it would be sinful. The gospel plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized, can't be partialed out. We can't say, well, let's take hearing and believing, and then somebody's saved. It doesn't work that way. Oh, okay. let's just take confession and repentance, and then it'll be, no, it doesn't work that way. Okay, let's just skip right to baptism. doesn't matter if anybody understands it or anything. That won't be acceptable either. We have to be a people who preach, as Paul said, the whole counsel of God, right? This passage doesn't scare us. It makes us bold. It gives us a mission. It sets a purpose for us to follow, a goal for us to achieve. We have to be a people who proclaim, who tell, who get the gospel out there. On your outline, I give you Acts chapter 8, 4 through 8. We've already looked at it. I've mentioned it. They go everywhere preaching the word. Okay? So we can't remain silent. If we remain silent, nobody is going to speak for us. Right? Think of that awesome task that we have. Think of it. I don't, how many people? Darren, how many people are in this metropolitan area? 50,000? At least. And, and here we are, 50 people. 50 people saying to 50,000, there's a better way. There's a better way that you can live. There are better things that you can do. There is a better reward than you can ever imagine here on earth that is waiting for you. We have to preach that, right? So what do we do? You give one of those cards. The, 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 well, it's empty right now. We'll fill it up. You give one of those business cards. You leave it on the table when the lady comes to pick up her tip. You pass it to the grocery clerk. Say, hey, if you ever get a chance, come see us. When you're going to the bank, you slide it over to the tailor. Uh, tailor teller. Teller. She might be a tailor also while she's a teller. Um, you slip it in there. That's evangelizing. That's proclamation. You might lean over the fence when your neighbor's out there and say, hey, how you doing, Jimmy? Haven't seen you in a while. You doing all right? Listen, if you get a chance, why don't you come visit us? All that is proclamation. Family members, you know? Family members, hey, you know, I'd love for you to come join us you know, this Sunday. Or we've got a great Bible study going on Wednesday night. All of those are ways that we can evangelize. You remember my story. I'm sitting on a bus in San Antonio, Texas, reading a Bible, and a guy comes up and says, hey, you want a Bible study? And I was a Catholic. And I said, well, sure. And here I am today with you fine folks, 29 years preaching. 29 years preaching. All because I took somebody up on their invitation to study a Bible. If that person would have remained silent, where would I be today? probably wouldn't be in the Lord's church. It's, it's sinful at times for us not to say something. Okay? Then he, <clears throat> Here's the final one. There is silence that is searing. Here, let me show you what I mean by this. Go to Matthew. You're in Romans. Turn backward. Go to Matthew chapter 22. And we'll begin there in verse 34. There, there are these times where it's not just Jesus. I give you... Um, Two examples here of Jesus dealing with the religious leaders. But think of the Apostle Paul and the encounters that Paul had with the religious leaders as well. But there are times when somebody is made silent because of what's been said. There, there, there's, there's not a way for them to answer. Not a way for them to respond. And we've got several. Here's Jesus talking to the Sadducees. It says this uh, in uh, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. 
So here's the message that gets back. Our, our religious brethren uh, couldn't even respond to what Jesus said. They couldn't answer him. And so it puts them into panic mode, and then they want to do things. But they couldn't answer. Because they couldn't answer according to what the Word of God would say. Because they weren't living according to what the Word of God would say. Then, there's in Matthew 22, go down to verse 46. It's the same thing. It says this, And no one was able to answer Jesus a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare question Him anymore. That is silence that is searing. What can I say? What can... There's, I, have, I have no response. You see it in a, a whole lot of ways. Um, and it happens a lot of times inadvertently. You don't mean for something to kind of be in this, this searing way. Um, and you're just being honest and open. And sometimes it comes across that way. Like um, I've been in conversations with people and they said, yeah, I mean, I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit and, and the miraculous gifts that he gives to me. And I'll, I'll say, well, you know, the miraculous gifts ended in, uh, in the first century when the apostles died out. And they look at you like you've got three heads. And to them, you probably do. But there's those times when it stops somebody and they go, huh. And you can see the, the wheels turning. You can see them contemplating what you say. You know, it's the question. All the only ones who are going to heaven are those in the church of Christ. The only ones going to heaven are those who are saved. And the church of Christ is comprised of those who are saved. So, yes, thank you. The church of Christ is going to heaven, right? There's those times where it just catches people, and they, they, they just don't know what to say or how to act. Well, speaking this truth is seen in different places. I'll give you a couple examples of elders and preachers who might say things that could be searing. Uh, go over to Titus. You've got to turn forward towards the end of your New Testament. Go to Titus chapter 1, beginning there in verse 10. And this is talking about elders and their responsibility. But notice, it says this, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Well, that's not surprising. The church was under persecution by the Jews, okay? whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. What they're saying is not good. Okay? One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true, that they said it. That they said that. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Rebuke them. How do you rebuke them? By the words that you speak. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, who turn from the truth. To the, to the pure, all things are pure. Or excuse me, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. The, those who profess, profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being, noticed abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Look at the responsibility that elders have. They have the responsibility of answering people, answering them to the point where they don't have a response back. All they can do is listen and be taught. Only thing that is in their mind at that moment, it's like a wheel turning and all of a sudden the hamster jumped off and the wheel stops. And you're left with that, okay, I don't know what to say. Well, listen to what's being said. I don't know how to answer what this is. Just listen to what's being said. And that's a responsibility of, of elders. I don't know how clear it can be in verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. Okay? So there is, there is silence that's searing. Now this happens also in the preaching of the gospel. Um, turn back in your Bible to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Uh, it says a lot of things to him, and I'll begin in verse 1. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus, uh, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, second coming. He says, preach the word. All right, we know that. We've seen that. We go all the way back to Acts chapter 8. We see that the church was growing. In verse 41, 
We see that it's growing in verse 47. We see that the church is growing in Acts chapter 5. We see the church is growing in Acts chapter 6. Chapter 8, we see it's growing. How is it growing? It's not growing by osmosis. It's growing by the preaching of the word. People are going out and they're speaking, okay? So he says this, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Notice, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Convince, rebuke, exhort. There are times when we say things that are that that sear somebody because they're hearing the truth for the first time. When you're talking to somebody who's a Methodist and you say, How can you be uh, in the church that's talked about in the New Testament? when the Methodist church didn't start for 1,700 years after the, the events in Acts chapter, one, Acts chapter 2. How can you be in that? And they're like, they, it's searing. They don't have a response. You know, It's the same thing when you have the opportunity to teach people. I've sat, um, do, y'all, do we, I don't think we, uh, do y'all, we, have, we don't have Jewel Miller here, do we? The film strips? We did? Okay. I've sat in people's living room with the, with the old film, the cassette tape and the little projector, and when it goes bing, you turn the slide, and I've done that. And when you get to the part about the church, and you, and you do, of course, the, guy, the narrator's voice is so deep and dark and everything, it just makes you feel reverent. And so you're flipping it over, and then they start talking about the foundation of the church, bing. And it starts talking about there's only one church, bing. Then it starts talking about one is added to only one church, bing. And then it starts talking about how there can be no other church but the church you read about in the New Testament. Bang. And I've looked at people and I've seen them just staring in disbelief. It's searing. It's like, that's not what I've been taught. That's something brand new to me. That happens when we preach the gospel. It happens when we do Bible studies. It happens, brethren, talking to family members who are in denominations or family members who don't want anything to do with religion. It happens when you're engaged in conversations with these people. Here's the thing. That moment of silence that is searing is our opportunity to keep on speaking. It's our opportunity while they're quiet to get what else needs to be in there. Well, oh, and let me remind you this. And then I, I hope you understand this. It's that opportunity while they're really beginning to process all these things that are going on. Right, so our car, our, our 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 car had trouble on the front end. When I'd go over a bump, it sounded like the whole engine was gonna fall out of the the front of the car, and it just got worse and worse. And Alicia's like, "Well, take it in." I said, "No, I know cars. I'm a man. I know cars. I don't know how to unhook the battery, but you know, I gotta. I know how it is. And so eventually, it gets bad enough for me. We take it in. The front end's falling off." Motor mounts are broke, tie rods gone, shocks gone, struts gone, all of it, just worn out, worn out. How it happened, I don't know, but they're sitting there, and they, so they do their inspection, and they come to me, and they say, they talk about Siri, and they say, okay, this is going to cost that much, and then this part is going to cost this much, and then this part, and this is what I did for 10 minutes. And then the Lord shined his light upon me. And he calls that man's mouth to speak the words. It's covered under your warranty. Amen, Jesus. Preach it. Right? But the searing. How much? I got to pay what? I can't, but he didn't stop, man. He took advantage of it. This guy ain't arguing with me. He ain't questioning what I'm saying. He's a good salesman. He's going to keep on going. When I'm silent, he's going to keep talking. It's the same thing for us. All we got to do is keep talking. That's all we got to do. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? Go over. Let me give you one more. Go back to the, the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. Go back to uh, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28 and verse 19. There's 19 and 20 have to go together. You know, I always tell you I, I love... Verses where you don't need a commentary, where the understanding is contained within the verse. I love those types of verses. Well, 19 and 20 are those types of verses. Okay, So n- notice what it says. It says, Go therefore 
and make disciples of all nations. Okay. So that's what we're told to do. We have to go uh, to all nations. And what is the purpose of our going? It's not just to say hi. It, 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 it's not just to say, you know, are you doing all right? It's to make disciples. That's always in the forefront of our mind. Making disciples. Winning people to Christ. Teaching people the gospel. Bringing people uh, to, to uh, an understanding of who God is. Teaching people the plan of salvation. That's the very first part. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Then when we are making these disciples, we've got to lead them into a saved relationship with God. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of times, people stop there. Verse 19 cannot exist on its own. It's not possible. I know, it's, I know the chapter breaks and the verse breaks are not inspired because there are terrible verse breaks and chapter breaks, and this is one of them. This should be one verse. When it's one verse, it makes it real easy to understand what our responsibility is. Let's read it as one verse. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Verse 20 begins saying what verse 19 has already said, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're making disciples. How do you make disciples? Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And one of the things that we have to remember is when we make disciples and they become Christians, that we don't stop there. We have to teach them to observe all things. There's more, right? We teach a person to come to the ability to hear the Word of God right, to, to, to believe, to repent, confess, to be baptized. But then there's this whole aspect of living faithfully, of building upon their faith and building their understanding. Nobody comes up out of the baptismal waters with a Ph.D. in theology. It doesn't happen that way, brethren. People come up out of the, bapti uh, the, the, bapti come out of the baptistry as New Testament Christians. And from there, the growth process begins to kick off. If it doesn't, they stagnate, they go to the fringe, and they drift away. But after you baptize them, if you get them going in a direction, you give them structure, you give them focus, you give them a point, right? You give them something to learn or to reach for. You give them something to challenge them. Those are the people that grow strong and they remain faithful, okay? All of that responsibility is on who? It's on you. It's on me. Because of verse 20, teaching them to observe all things. There should be no baptized talking about silence. There should be no baptized orphans. When people become a New Testament Christian, they need other Christians around them to encourage them, to instruct them, to teach them. Goodness, even what Paul told Timothy, a time to be rebuked. Right? You ever been rebuked by a brother or sister in Christ? If you haven't, hold on, it's coming. It is. Because brothers and sisters love us. They talk honestly to us. All of this has to do with silence. The sound of silence. What type of silence is acceptable and what type of silence, not only is it unacceptable, but let's be real honest, right? It's sinful. So the judgment is left upon us. When should we speak and when should we remain silent? When should we be a people of gospel preaching or be a people who just listen? We have to know and understand when it's an appropriate time for us to act, for us to respond, for us to get involved. It's important for us to do that. The question is, will we? Will we? Here's the one thing. There's a lot of things that I want to hear. I, I, you, man, I need to come up with new things. You always, you always hear me say this. I know you do. I know you do. I'm in it for heaven. I ain't in this Christian race to win a watch. Keep it. I ain't in it to get at the end of 40 years you know, a certificate to Golden Corral, all-you-can-eat buffet. I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't in it. I'm in it for eternity with God. I'll be honest with you. That's my goal. That's what I work towards. That's where my focus is. And I want as many people as I can influence to go to heaven with me. That's my focus, and that's my goal. What I have to say and what I don't have to say, I'm going to be very careful with because I want to say the right thing when it needs to be said, and I want to remain quiet when it needs to be quiet. You know, people always say, what do you say to the family that's just lost a loved one and you're greeting them at the funeral home? You don't have to say anything. 
Give them a hug. Give them a squeeze on the shoulder. Take their hand into both your hands and shake it with them. People don't realize sometimes silence says more than anything you can fumble through. Just be there. Listen. Is your silence suitable? Or is your silence sinful? We all need to talk. Listen, the lesson is yours I hope it's beneficial to you. You have your outline there. I give you four. You can add four more to that. Take that and and add to it and help that lesson to grow. If you are here this evening and you would like us to pray with you, um, we'll do that. If you'd like us to pray for you, we'll do that as well. I know we have folks who are watching over the Internet. We always like to include them in the invitation. If you're watching over the Internet and you're not a New Testament Christian, please listen to me. You need to be. If you'll follow the gospel plan of salvation to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized, you can become a New Testament Christian. If you don't know how to do that, contact us. Our information is right down there on the screen you're watching. Contact that. Up. Contact us, and I'll be happy to do a study with you. For those who are here, if we can help you, come forward as we stand and sing.